Well, my name is Carol Caruana, and I I uh, lived on. I was born in Brooklyn, and I lived on Long Island until I was ready to go to college. And when I did, when I was ready, I went to the University of Pennsylvania. I graduated there from medical school as well, and I was at a doing my internship and. They had this kind of like um, like a uh, a job day, a job fair day, and it was some of the armed forces, and there were other computer f people, and you know that type of thing. And so I just went down to see what was going on, <clears throat> and um, I went, stopped at the Navy place, and you know the recruiter for the Navy, and I, I stopped, and we talked, and this and that, and the other thing, and the deal was that I would serve six years, but I would come free of all my medical debt. So my school debt would be wiped out. So then I went to the army and I said, well, what am I doing? I don't want to go into the service. What, what am I, nuts? You know, I really didn't want to. I thought about it. So anyway, make a long story short, I, I, I said, I think I, I like the Navy. And so I, I enlisted. Well. They enlisted me because the recruiter was already there. And, and then they sent me for training. And then after training, I was um, surprised because I went, they sent me to the, you know, the Marine Island in South Carolina. And, and so from there, um, they put me on a on a jumbo jet, and that jumbo jet <laughs> was a C-130, and it, and it held. I mean, it could hold. It held tanks and cars and jeeps and men and and women that were nurses and other medical personnel. And there are no seats. You're strapped to the wall. What's very what was very pleasant. There are no bathrooms on board. So we took a uh, blanket and put it up and the ladies would hold it so that if I had to go, we'd have some privacy. And the guys too. I mean, it was, it was a little, uh, a little different. And uh, so from there we landed. Um, uh, in, uh, I actually forget the name of the place, the first landing we made, but the second landing was in Da Nang, Vietnam. What year was this? 1967. Uh, no, I'm sorry, 1968-69. I had two tours there. So a bunch of the nurses volunteered to go and help pick up some men, and I said, well, Look, I'm not doing anything right now. I'll go with you. And I did. And we picked up some wounded and brought them back. And none of them were really wounded enough to require that I stay. So I went one more time. And when I went, there was a great deal of ground fire, which, truthfully, I had never really been exposed to that much noise and I mean noise yes but not not in the heat of of the moment and of course the Viet Cong had there's nothing like the sound of an AK-47 which is a Russian made gun and it's made by whatever his name is the AK is is what his name is and um, I was helping you know, someone on board, and I, I heard it. I heard the shot. It hit the door. See, the helicopters were 
uh, specially made. They were not like the ones in Korea, which were Yui's, and they had the glass bubble on it, you know. Ours were also Yui's, but there's another name for them, I don't remember. But they were with the sliding doors. We didn't have the stretchers on the side. We could put the wounded inside the helicopter, and, and the bullet hit the door and then ricocheted. And I turned to here, and it's only a fraction of a second, and it hit me in the face. And um, I got back, you know, Carol, you want morphine? You want morphine? Yeah, give me morphine. Give me morphine, you know. Um, but were there any, there must have been some people that sort of, you know, some stories that sort of stuck with you or some people that kind of stuck with you. Are there anyone that comes to mind that you remember? That well, I remember this one young man. He was, he was, um, He was very, very much, he had blonde hair and blue eyes, the bluest eyes you've ever seen. And he had stepped on the bouncing Betty and he lost everything from his bowels down. He was still alive. And there's nothing we could do to keep him alive. Just nothing. And, uh, but he talked. And, and we sat there and we talked for maybe a total of three, four minutes, that's all. And he said to me, will you hold my hand? I don't think I'm going to be here much longer. I remember him. I remember him. Do you remember what you, what you talked about? I beg your pardon? Do you remember what yes, you I, but I'm not going to share that with you. That's a private, it's very private. And I remember a couple other, other people, other young men that came in and, uh, hey doc, did you make it so I'll be seven feet tall and women will love me? And, you know, mostly the camaraderie with those people who uh, were wounded badly, but still you remember them because they were funny or they uh, told stories. One funny story, that's what I was going to tell you. I think we drank one night so much that we didn't even know who we were. I was a lieutenant commander and that was my rank. And <laughs> we were so drunk. I mean, really drunk. And we decided we were gonna go for a helicopter ride. So there were about six of us. We all piled it in this helicopter and we were still drinking. The pilot, I don't think, knew what the hell he was doing. So we, he got the, 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 the helicopter started and whatever they do up in the cockpit, you know, they have to go through a whole bunch of stuff up there. And, and we lifted off the ground. Oh, we were having a ball. We were having a ball. Laughing, joking, you know. And I happened to look out and I said, hey, Phil, don't you think that, that you're a little low? I could see the treetops. Hey, Phil, I think we're in a tree. We did, we landed in a tree. And, um, we broke one of the blades and 
that was pretty serious. But, but we were very, very good soldiers. We let down the ladders and we climbed down out of the helicopter that was still stuck on top of this tree. Well, needless to say, the CO of the company, of the commanding post, he wanted us all court-martialed, jailed, tarred and feathered, you know, and he wrote reports and all of this and that. And we were nurses and doctors on that on that flight. So he said he's going to give us an article, whatever, and have us dishonor dishonorably discharged. So we said, what? That's great. That's wonderful. You mean we don't have to stay in this camp anymore? We can go? And And there was a... There was a little to do about it, but we got, we got uh, our duties were, I had to clean uh, some of the latrines, war of any kind is harder on the people who are in it and understand it. That's why you'll find that many vets do not want to talk about their experiences. And um, that's, I mean, I'm not going to go into gory details. It's not necessary. Go to your VA. Help a wounded veteran. Give to those people who gave so much of their lives and came back to so little. When the Vietnam War was quote, over, and you saw men who were, some of them came, joined when they were 18, and they came back, and uh, they had nothing to do. Nobody wanted them. Nobody wanted to hire them. Nobody wanted them to stay with them. They were embarrassed and ashamed. And so you go to New York City in the 70s and 80s, and all the homeless men, and you knew they were young. You could just have to look in their eyes. Well, they were veterans. They had no place to go. They were dishonored. And, and not care for. So that's my own opinion. War is terrible. Vietnam was a very different war, war that the United States of America was not, I feel, personally, was never prepared for. Um, the terrain, the use of biochemical, uh, Agent Orange. I don't know if you'll put this in or not, but it doesn't matter to me. They used Agent Orange as a defoliant. How many Vietnam veterans today suffer, die from cancers and all My types? Dad did, yeah. Your dad did. You say he's still alive, but he had, deals with those effects all the time. Yeah, As a, was he a Vietnam vet? Well, then, then, you know what I'm saying is is true. Mm -hmm. And the thing that upsets me the most is that whether it's true or not, I believe it's true, and I believe Dow Chemical knew exactly what that napalm and and Agent Orange would do. And I want the children in this country to know what what really this country stands for. 
without being political. You do what you want. You're free to do whatever you want. You don't have to get a written letter from the czar of, you know, Mesopotamia or something to go from New York to South Carolina to California to wherever. You can travel freely in the United States.